Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's my second time in Warsaw this year. Um, I taught a workshop here with the Code Sprinters folks um, a few months ago, and I'm thrilled to come back and uh, spend a, a day with you today talking about, uh, I'm going to talk about Sense and Respond more so than Lean UX this morning. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, a couple of things. I'm going to talk about rethinking the measure of success for the work that we do and challenging some of the traditional agile definitions of done and success. But then we're going to take the conversation forward a little bit and we're going to talk about how redefining done without paying attention to the real world consequences that this new measure of success impact can also be uh, detrimental to the people that we're trying to serve, the people who use our products and services and so forth, and, and really talk about what we can do uh, to make that better. And so to start with that, um, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story uh, about where I started my career. Uh, I started my career here, making, uh, in fact, designing the software that went on these CDs. Now, uh, you were lucky here in Poland because we did not send these to you from America. You're welcome. Uh, we would, s the, the way this worked, so this is 20 years ago. This, is, this was the nature of software. We would work for six months to get everything as perfect as possible. And then we would print 15 million copies of these CDs. And then we would ship them to people in the United States, in France, in the UK, and in Germany. And we would wait to see whether people actually installed it, whether they used it, whether they found value in it, whether they continued to use it. And we would learn from that usage. And then we'd work for another six months. And then we'd print 15 million more CDs. And then we'd send them to all those people again, and the cycle would start over again. Our feedback loop to find out if we had delivered anything of value was 12 months, at least. Right? That was, that's how long it took us to iterate on this particular software because it came in this fixed format. Now, back then, right, the nature of software development was fundamentally different. First and foremost, learning loops were long, six to 12 months at least, to find out if the thing that we shipped actually solved a real problem for a real customer and delivered any value back to the company. 20 years ago, software adoption was slow. It took time. People had, you had to go to the store and buy a box of software or wait for it to show up in the mail from us. So it took time for people to get software, to install it, to use it, to tell their friends about it. It took a long time. Uh, the impact of the technology that we were making 20 years ago was largely limited to tech-savvy people because they were the ones who could afford computers. They're the ones who bought computers. There wasn't a computer in every household. Right, so our impact was limited to the people who actually cared enough to buy a computer and buy software. Thank you. The goal, when we were making the software, was works as designed. Right? That was it. Our goal was to make sure that the way that the, you know, the specification document was this big, and as long as the software did what the specification document said, that was it. That was the goal. And the measure of success was shipping the software, right? That was it. We would work for those six months. Every project would have a name, uh, you know, Project Diamond or whatever it was. And uh, at the end of the, of the project, we'd ship the software. We would have a party. Everybody would get a T-shirt with the name of the project on it. And then we'd move on to the next thing. And that was the definition of success. And that was 20 years ago. But things have fundamentally changed in the last 20 years when it comes to the nature of software development. And perhaps the most important thing is that software has consumed the world. In, in 2011, Mark Andreessen famous, famously said, software is eating the world. It's been eight, maybe even almost nine years since he said that. At this point, software has eaten the world. Everything has technology in it, right? We don't go to the store. We don't buy a box of software. Software is in everything, right? It's in our phones, obviously. Uh, it's in our coffee makers. Coffee makers have technology and software in them. And it turns out that people are even trying to put technology into salt shakers. Uh, 
This is the Smalt. It's the world's first connected salt shaker. But again, technology, why, I don't know, right? But, but technology is eating the world, right? But, uh, but I, the idea is that software is in literally everything. And what's different about software today, not, not just that it's in everything, but what's different about software today uh, is the nature of software. 20 years ago, when we were at AOL, the s software was static. It was, uh, we, we produced it, we printed it, we were done, and then you kind of had to go buy a static version of it. But today, the nature of software is fundamentally different. You don't buy it in a store, right? You don't really, you don't even really wait for updates, just kind of continuously updates itself. And so the, the nature of it has gone from being this static medium through the, the benefits of continuous deployment and integration, automated testing, DevOps, all of these things have given us the ability to get software into the hands of our users as quickly as we want, which means that the software that we use today is continuous. I just want to see this on the big screen. It's kind of cool, right? <laughs> <coughs> software is continuous. It never ends. We're building these systems, right? There's, there's, it's not a fixed thing that we ship and then we, f you know, we kind of forget about it. We're building these systems that we can now continuously improve, right? Agile, continuous learning, continuous improvement, all of those things. And the companies who are now building all of the technology in the world, not just tech companies, but all these kind of big companies, are getting it. We're starting to see the conversation shift inside our companies. Now, I love this quote. Because I don't think that there is somebody higher up in, in BBVA, the big Spanish bank, than this guy. He's the group executive chairman. And the interesting part is what he says in orange up here. He says, we are competing in a race that has no finish line or predetermined route. Right? This is where Agile should shine. Right? If, if organizations get this, Right? This is where agility shines. Right? If we, we don't know, there is no finish line. Right? We're just kind of continuously improving these systems, and we can't really predict how we will continuously improve these systems. Right? Then this is where the stuff that we do, the kind of ideas and methods and ways of working that we promote should shine. Organizations are getting this, and that's due to this continuous nature of software. Now, we're seeing the impact here, the, the shift in thinking from organizations. Now, if you think about the way that we used to build products, right? And the car industry is a perfect example of this, right? In the automotive industry, for 100 years, the only way to get your car to do new things was to buy next year's model, right? So if your 2019 model doesn't do everything that you want it to do, you have to buy the 2020 model, right? Except there's no reason for this, right? It's a marketing gimmick, right? It was conceived by Alfred Sloan at General Motors 100 years ago to get you to continue to buy a new car, to get next year's model and next year's model. And we took the same approach and we applied it to static software, right? We had Windows 95, we had Windows 98, we had Windows 2000, and <laughs> luckily sort of ended after this, right? But the idea is that this, 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 the, the mental model of the only way to get the thing to do new stuff was to kind of ship the next version of it and buy the next version of it permeated into software. But then some software-minded people started changing the way that we think about the delivery of value, especially when it comes to automotive products and services. And all of a sudden, right, your car can do new things by sitting in, in the driveway overnight. You wake up in the morning and the car can do new things. In fact, this, uh, I don't own a Tesla, but a, a good friend of mine does. Uh, his name is Adam. Adam texted me the other day and he said, uh, he showed me a screenshot of his app for his Tesla. He has a Model 3. Um, of course, the car has an app. Uh, he says, I woke up this morning and the app had an update. First of all, I have Spotify in my car. He was excited about that. Um, but second, he said, look, there's a new button on the app. It says, it says the button says, come to me. <laughs> right? And you push the button and the car comes, right? Wherever it is, wherever you are, the car just shows up. It didn't, the car didn't do that yesterday. Right? That's amazing. That's the nature of the technology that we're building. And in fact, it's not just the, the products themselves. It's the systems that support the product that can also be continuously improved. We can continuously make things better. The story here in the middle is about how Tesla went from a tweet to a change in the system in six days. 
The story in the middle starts with a tweet. This guy Loic tweets at Elon Musk. We all call him Elon. He says, hey, Elon, um, every time I go charge my car in San Mateo, which is in Northern California, uh, he, um, we'll call him people. He uses a different word <laughs> in the tweet. Um, people are charging their Teslas. Their cars are full. They've walked away, and I can't charge my car. Elon Musk the CEO of the company is sensing customer feedback from the market, and he responds back within an hour, and he says, you're right, this is a problem, I'm on it. Six days later, Tesla changes the way that the supercharger network works. Every minute that your car stays connected to a charger, after it is full, costs you money. Right? They were able to react in six days because they think like a modern-day software company. They think in systems, they think in continuous learning and continuous improvement. There is no way in the world that a BMW or a Daimler or a General Motors or, or really any, any car, traditional car company could ever react in this time frame because they think in model years. Right? That's the fundamental difference that modern technology affords us. And what's amazing is that it gives us this tremendous opportunity. This new capability provides us with a tremendous opportunity to build a continuous conversation with the people that we serve. And I'm talking about the people who use the products and services that we make. We have the ability to get ideas into market quickly. Right, to ship things very, very quickly, the smallest things that we can. We have the ability to find out, to sense how those ideas impact the behavior of the people that we build products for. And we have the responsibility to answer the question, what are we going to do about it? Which is responding to what we've learned. Now, what we've got here is a feedback loop. Now, the amazing thing here is that in my AOL days, this feedback loop was 12 months long. But today, we can get through this loop very, very, very quickly. As fast as we want, really. Right? There's nothing limiting us from building a feedback loop that allows us to put something small into the hands of our customers, to see how it impacts their behavior, and then to respond to that. And in fact, it's in our best interest to reduce this cycle time as much as possible. Because the faster that we can get around this feedback loop, the less we invest in our idea. The less we invest in our idea, the easier it is to be wrong. And if it's easy to be wrong, it's easy to change course. And that's agile, right? That's it, right? The ability to change course based on learning. And so the faster that we can build these feedback loops with modern technology, the more agile we can be as organizations. And the less value we actually begin to place on the things that we put into market. Because think about it. If you can, if you can get around this loop in minutes or seconds, Right? The deployment of a feature actually is a non-event. It doesn't really matter. The measure of success has to actually fundamentally change. So we have to start getting out of this mindset that uh, we're, we're a software factor. Right? The more stuff we make does not actually mean that we are delivering more value. Okay? The only thing that we're guaranteed uh, to have when we deliver more code is more code. That's it. That's all there is to it. And so we have to change our measure of success and really get out of this mindset that says, well, I know, I know we can build it, right? So why don't we build it, right? Again, I arrived on an airplane here yesterday. The airplane that I arrived on had seven fewer wings than this one. And it worked just fine. Our measure of success changes to outcomes. Outcomes are the measurable changes in customer behavior after we give them the products that we serve, right? It's these outcomes that tell us when we've delivered value because people have changed their way, the, the way that they're interacting with the system in a positive way, right? We've given them something that solves a real problem for them. We can measure that and then we can improve that. And it's these outcomes that tell us when we're done, right? Because if shipping the feature is a non-event, how do we know when we're done? We're done when we've maximized the, the impact 
that the system can have on customer behavior, right? We've maximized the change in behavior that we can drive forward. Now, I want to show you a couple of examples. And then we're going to kind of see how this can be, uh, how we've got to really take the broader context into uh, consideration. Look, paying attention to what your customers do and what they do with the products and services that you make is critical to the survival of your company and your organization. Okay. Gibson Guitars filed for bankruptcy. Did you guys know this? It's very sad. If you're a guitar player, a musician, Gibson Guitar has been around 100 years. They filed for bankruptcy. What they noticed was that the guitar buying market was slowing down. They weren't selling as many guitars. And so they hired a CEO who was set on innovation. His goal was innovation. The latest ideas, the latest gadgets, the latest improvements to the guitars and these new accessories, right? And that's what, what, that's what was going to turn their fortunes around. Without paying attention to what was actually happening with the guitar buying market, they just started putting a bunch of features out there. New gadgets, new toys, new tools for guitars. They never even changed what they, their face was to the world. This is Gibson's face to the world. Slash, the guitar gods, right? None of this helped, and Gibson Guitars filed for bankruptcy. Interestingly enough, Fender Guitars, Gibson's direct competitor, is thriving. They're doing really well because they paid attention to the customer. They paid attention to the people they were making products and services for. And what they realized was, yes, guitar sales were slowing down, but over half of new guitar buyers were women. This was a change in the marketplace. This is what the Fender website looks like. This is what it means to cater to your audience, to understand their needs, and to deliver products and services that affect their behavior. Right? Let's build products that meet their needs. Let's provide them with services that teach them how to play these guitars. And guess what? Most of these new guitar buyers don't care that much about Slash. Let's put people on the website who look like the buyers right? to make them feel like there's a community here. And they're thriving and they're succeeding because they're paying attention to the market. And their measure of success is not how many new guitar pedals or new guitar features we put out, right? but how are we impacting the behavior of the guitar buying market. It absolutely changes this way. Now, the challenge, the challenge with all of this, and this is where continuous learning shines, is that we cannot predict behavior. We think we can. We think we know exactly what to build or how to implement something, and we think we know exactly what our users are going to do with it, right? But the reality is that we don't. This is an intersection in Massachusetts. Somebody had the job of making this a safer intersection, and their goal was to get people to stop at the intersection and to not turn left. What would you do to get people to stop at this intersection and not turn left? Stop sign. Right. Feels like that, that would work, right? Well, this is Massachusetts. People drive a very special way in Massachusetts. We have a name for them. Anybody know the name? It's a really kind of a very um, super local American thing. Uh, we call them mass holes. Did you guys know this? <laughs> the drivers in Massachusetts. True story. There you go. Now look, the, the, the point of this is that we think we know what's going to work, but the reality is that there's a good chance that we're going to be wrong. We want to, the measure of success was not deploying the signs, was actually getting people to stop and not turn left, and that's our goal. And that's, again, fundamentally the difference, is that we think we can make the thing, the output, and it will make a difference, but the outcome is the behavior change that we are ultimately looking for. Now, we build software systems. Software systems are complex and unpredictable. Right? We know this right now. Uh, it turns out that humans are also complex and unpredictable and stubborn. And the things that you put in front of them, right, if they see them as an obstacle, they will figure out a way to work around that obstacle or exploit that to their own benefit, as you can see here. And what's fascinating is that the behavior of the people who use our systems evolve and the behaviors emerge through the use of the systems that we build. So we have a sense of what we think people will do initially, and then maybe they start doing that, but then they start doing something different. And we didn't predict that. And so the faster that we can learn and adapt, right, sense and respond, the faster that we can build better systems. Here, I'll show you an example of this really quick. 
This is Instagram. Uh, I'm sure you all know it. Instagram is the place where you go and you post that one perfect picture of the day. Right? So I, I was walking around the last couple of, uh, last sort of 18 hours here in Warsaw. I took a lot of pictures um, and I uh, get back to my hotel room, you know, and, and uh, I go through my photos. I pick the good one, you know, and I edit it a little bit, and I put it up on Instagram, and then I kind of wait for the likes, you know? I do. I really do this. That's, uh, um, it's a lot of pressure, right? You think it's a lot of pressure for me, it's a ton more pressure for teenage girls, as it turns out, right? Now, teenage girls, a teenage girl will go to the beach, and someone will take this photo of her, right? This part is the part that gets cropped and ends up on Instagram. This part does not. Right, dad over here gets cut out of the photo. It's a, ton of, it's a ton of pressure to put up that one perfect picture and maintain the image that you're trying to maintain, especially as a teenage girl. Instagram sensed an emergent behavior in the system because of this. They saw the rise of a thing called Finsta. How many of you have heard of Finsta? Very few of you. If you have a teenage daughter or you know a teenage girl, ask her. I guarantee you she has multiple Finsta accounts. A fake Instagram is what it stands for. They're private groups primarily made up of teenage girls where they can do stuff like this to relieve the pressure of posting that one perfect picture of the day. I have two teenage daughters and between the two of them there are they I of I know of six Finsta accounts. That's what I know of. Who knows how many more there are, okay? But the idea is that this behavior emerged. Instagram never predicted this, but they sensed it in their system. They sensed it outside of their system with the growth of Snapchat. They brought it in-house with Instagram stories, and they continued to improve it based on the emergent behaviors in the system. They continue to make the experience better for their customers based on these particular practices, right? And we can use this ability to learn continuously to, to to con build continuous success into our businesses like Instagram does. Um, I love this example from City Mapper. Do you guys know City Mapper? It's a London-based navigation app for anything but driving. So it's a city-based navigation app, and it's you know, taxis, walking, bicycles, everything but getting in a car and driving. And it's a really fantastic tool for navigating major world cities. Now, the outcome I'm assuming that City Mapper might be interested in is that people arrive at their destinations faster and more consistently. And they're collecting this data, they're sensing, and they're responding. And what's really fascinating is that what they realized is that there's a route in London that people keep trying to use to, to go in a particular, they're trying to go from point A to point B, and there's nothing that serves that route. There's no public transportation, there's no bike stations, there's nothing that serves that route. And they're sensing this behavior in their system. And for them, they saw this as an opportunity, right? If we're continuously learning, maybe there's a, a, an adjacent business we can get into. They built a bus that goes for those two, between those two points that aren't served by Transport for London, right? And they designed the bus to have the same user experience as the City Mapper app, which is pretty good, right? So the app looks, the bus looks like that, the bus driver software looks like that, but the idea is that through continuously learning, we can find ways to improve not only the user experience, but maybe adjacent businesses or different ways for us to improve the success of our organizations. So a lot of positive stuff, a lot of opportunity that comes from this, but there's a risk here as well. And the risk is this, is that as we continue to optimize for these changes in customer behaviors, if we lose sight of what's happening on a more macro level, we start to create these negative real-world unintended consequences. Let me show you what happened. So we've got uh, our friends at Twitter, for example. Now, Twitter, to talk about emergent behavior, right? Um, the hashtag was emergent behavior. A user suggested it. Twitter jumped on the idea. Today, they've monetized it. Anything that uh, you use and love on Twitter today was conceived that way, it was conceived through uh, emergent behavior in the system, right? But all of a sudden, that emergent behavior in the system moved on from hashtags and at replies and retweets and moved into some negative real-world consequences, right? Harassment, trolling, doxing, uh, bot farms, all of these things, and all of a sudden you've got these, uh, uh, the, the CEOs of these companies being called in front of government bodies to explain how their tools 
uh, which are being optimized for user behavior, are now negatively impacting the world. And our friends in leadership over at these organizations, uh, you know, they're trying to say, they say, look, we're, we are committing Twitter to help increase the collective health, right? But we didn't fully predict or understand the real world negative consequences. Human behavior is complex and unpredictable, right? We weren't ready for this. Um, but uh, we're, we're building a systemic framework to help move this forward. And uh, we're going to work fast and learn and try to improve the conversation. This is Jack's public response to this critique. And Twitter gave him the response that he deserved because that's what Twitter does. Right? This is exactly the kind of response that he deserved for this comment. And the reality is this. Okay? We talk a lot about moving from output to outcome. I talk a lot about it, I guarantee you, all the time. It's all I talk about. Right? But the risk here is that when we blindly optimize for metrics without considering the real-world implications, it starts to become, at best, it becomes risky. And in some cases, it can actually become criminal. And I'll show you some examples to get you thinking about how you're building these continuous systems, these continuous improvement ways of working, and how to make sure that you're always paying attention to those other consequences that maybe we didn't pay so much attention to. Let me show you a few examples, okay? Uh, in the name of engagement, engagement is an outcome, right? We want people to engage in our software. We've got the 800-pound uh, the gorilla in the room is Facebook. Facebook has gifted us with the outcome metrics of Mao and Dow. You guys know those? Monthly active users, daily active users. And everything that Facebook does is designed to optimize those two metrics, to get people onto the system on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, and to use it regularly. So for example, they optimize the system for that in Myanmar, where Facebook is the internet, kind of like AOL was back in the day. Facebook is the internet. And people were engaging on a daily basis and were being encouraged to engage through Facebook as they were outing the Rohingya minorities in Myanmar who were then being rounded up and ethnically cleansed out of that country. Right? Facebook is actually being considered as, a, as, a, as a, uh, a criminal part of encouraging this genocide that's happening in Myanmar because they were encouraging their users in that country to engage with the system on a daily basis, which is pretty amazing. And again, to maintain that engagement, they're announcing that, you know what, we're actually gonna let uh, po po political ads lie on the platform, right? We're not gonna fact check them, you can post whatever you want, because they know that the, the greater, that the, the, the more kind of incendiary the political ad is, the more engaged people get. The more they share, the more they come back, the more they view, the daily active user number goes up, that's the outcome. Right? But what's the negative real-world consequence in all of that? YouTube is another uh, conspirator here to think about. YouTube also optimizes for engagement, for time on site, for number of videos viewed. Right? And the algorithm there is designed to get you to watch as many more videos of the same type as you've started watching. And so if you accidentally start to go down a particular path, the algorithm is designed to give you more and more and more of those particular videos. And what ends up happening is they end up radicalizing young white men around the world. Because they watch one video on one topic and YouTube's like, oh, you like Nazis? Here's a thousand more videos on Nazis. And just kind of keep watching. Right? This is an outcome that they're optimizing for. They're not paying attention to those pesky, real-world negative consequences. In the name of sales, a goal for most commerce companies, right? Sure, which is the right thing to do. It can cause relationship stress. There's a story that came out a few years ago about how Target does data analysis. They do big data analysis. And there is a behavior pattern that they've identified that women take part in when they are pregnant. And when they identify that behavior, they start to change the advertising that that woman gets online and in her mailbox. A teenage girl started to get advertising and flyers at home uh, for maternity products, right? Except she hadn't told her father that she was pregnant yet. And her father found these things and he kind of went down to the store. He's like, why are you sending my daughter all these pregnancy materials? And they're like, well, that's what the algorithm said. She was pregnant. He came home, and sure enough, his daughter had not told him yet that she was pregnant. Right? Somebody wrote that software. 
Somebody created that and didn't think about the broader impact of that software, right? In the name of efficiency, it can discriminate, right? If we don't think about these outcomes, we want to build efficiency, right? Make people more efficient at work, more productive, more profitable, right? Think about this. Let's say you work in HR at Amazon. How many CVs do you think you get every day, every week? It's likely to be thousands. So some engineers at Amazon wrote an algorithm, an AI algorithm, to sift through the CVs. Except the biases of the engineers who wrote that algorithm ended up in the AI. And so the AI was actually sorting, downgrading resumes uh, that had words like women's, and anything like women's chess team, women's volleyball team, downgraded uh, CVs that came from primarily uh, uh, women, uh, uh, women attended colleges, Right? in the name of efficiency, the efficiency of these HR folks to make better decisions faster. But in doing so, we began to discriminate against the actual applicants of, uh, to the company. Uh, this is super interesting as well. This came out really recently. Um, they're starting to use AI, facial recognition AI, to determine whether you'll be a good candidate for a, for a position, or whether you'll do a good job. And they are comparing your facial expressions against somebody else who they believe has done a good job at the company. It's actually unbelievable, right? It selects the best applicants by assessing their performances against people who have done a good job in the past. Right, again, what are the real world consequences that could go here? Because again, we're driving outcomes here. The outcomes are efficiency, right? Uh, reducing time to fill. I used to work in the jobs industry, right? Time to fill is an outcome, how quickly it takes us to put a qualified candidate in a seat, et cetera, and to move this forward, right? It's, um, the facial recognition technology is based on some sort of uh, base, right, that has biases built into it. Uh, in the name of convenience, we can actually use, use to harm people. This is, a, this is, again, not a particularly happy story, but uh, we love all this home automation stuff, right? We can turn our lights on, set our alarm, uh, look, at the, you know, look at the camera, um, tur turn the air conditioning on and off with our phones and everything, which is great when everything is happy, right? But when couples break up, and they don't disconnect the apps from the homes they used to share, they can actually be used to abuse their ex-partners, right? There are stories after story after story of partners who are being abused by ex-partners through uh, you know, turning the air conditioning, the temperature way down, turning the heat way up, the sound way up, locking the doors, not letting them out. And when we don't consider that in the work that we do, we start to create these pesky outcomes in the world. And then lastly, in the name of news, it really can elevate uh, the worst in all of us, right? There's a, sadly, there's, there's a news cycle here that feeds on this. And uh, again, we watch and we consume, and then it ends up elevating literally the worst people in the world into power. And the reality is social media is super easy to pick on, right? But, but, we, I, but there's examples in retail, there's examples in commerce, and every organization has the possibility to take those outcomes and push them to a point where they don't actually help the customer anymore, but they actually end up hurting them. The reality at the end of the day is that this is a leadership issue. This is not, right? Paying attention to, the, to the, these negative real world consequences is not what the CEOs of these companies are being paid to do, right? They're being invested in and paid to drive things like monthly active users and daily active users no matter what. So whatever gets the job done, that will move us forward, right? Uh, I actually, I, I really like this particular tweet, um, a picture of Jack again, right? Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to user engagement, right? That's our goal, right? That's the outcome that we're driving for. Now, look, let's bring this home, okay? A couple things to keep an eye on. Now, I, look, I, I travel the world, I work with a lot of teams, and I talk about managing the outcomes all the time, right? I absolutely believe that it is a better way of working. And I hear things like this all the time, especially from developers. I trust my product manager, right? Product manager told me to build it, I'm gonna build it. That's unacceptable today, right? There's too much at stake with the code that you're writing, with the code that you're improving, with the processes and the ways of working for us to blindly say, well, I just trust that person. Right? We have to work together as a team. And, and again, this concept of, well, I just want to write code, right? I don't want to talk to customers. I don't want, this is all I want to do all day, right? The cat gif always lightens the mood a little bit. Um, 
again, that's not modern software development anymore, right? It's not modern, so agile, customer-centric software development. We've got to pay attention to all of this, right? Because again, as my friend Kenneth uh, said in his very, very good book uh, called Future Ethics, he said, look, the, the new technologies that we build they bear our ethical fingerprints, right? The teams that we manage, the teams that we coach, the teams that we build, those ethical fingerprints end up in that code. And so we have to make sure as we're continuously improving these systems that that code is actually delivering a better outcome for the people that we serve. And we always have to ask the question, but what will our code be used to do? Right? We simply can't work in these blind, I trust my product manager world, right? This is a guy named James Liang. He's in jail for four years. He's the guy who wrote the code that cheated the emissions scanners for at Volkswagen, the diesel emissions scanners. What did he think his code was going to do? He could continuously optimize that code all day. He continuously improve it all day long, right? And it, like the outcome was what? Beat 99% of the, of the emission machines, right? By the way, he's the only one in jail for this, right? The CEOs, they're not in jail for this. He's literally in jail. The thing I want you to take away from is this. Um, I love this quote from my friend Kim. She talks about when we build these, our teams and we think about responsible ways of working, we think about continuous improvement, we think about customer centricity, we want to be goal-driven but values-guided and we want to measure both. Goal-driven, goals, those are our outcomes, right? Those are the customer behavior changes we want to see. Values guided means what are the things that we are not willing to sacrifice to achieve the goal? And to measure both and to balance both against each other and to ask yourselves continuously, right? Are we sacrificing our values to get there? To wrap this up, I want to talk about what you can do, okay? Simple stuff. And especially if you're in a position, uh, to, if, if you're leading a team, managing a team, coaching a team, something along those lines, there's a lot that you can tell your teams to do. First and foremost, understand your business model. Really important. How does your company make money? Right? How does the component that your team is working on ladder up into that program? Right? Just understand how you make money. Take an interest in your customers. To be outcome driven, you have to actually pay attention to the people using your products and services. What are they doing? What are they trying to do? What's getting in their way? What matters to them? How do we serve that? Are we serving that? Participate in those activities. Use the software to learn. We've got tremendous capability to learn continuously. We can build that learning loop and reduce that time to learning to be really minutes if we wanted it to be so that we can learn as quickly as possible. Measure the impact of your work. As, you, as we ship something, did it actually impact the customer in a positive way, right? The definition of done is we want to impact the customer in a positive way. Don't forget the dangerous edge cases. It's so easy to talk about the happy path, the 80% case, right? 80% of the users will do it this way. Awesome. What about the other 20%, right? Discuss those dangerous edge cases. And then finally, uh, and this is within your power, refuse the work that harms people. You don't have to do it, right? Raise your hand and say, look, I don't want to do this. Right? Here's why I don't want to do it. I want you to understand that. And it's possible, right? We're seeing, uh, we're seeing groups organize within organizations, within companies, to fight back. This was 20,000 people who protested at Google, walked out of their jobs for a day to protest bonuses that were paid to executives who were accused of sexual harassment. Right? You can and you do have the power to stand up and say, look, this is not right. We're optimizing a behavior that is actually harming people, and we're going to walk away from that. And so to wrap this up and bring this home, uh, Jurassic Park always has endless good quotes for all this stuff. Keep this in mind as you're building your continuous learning, agile, continuous improvement, customer-centric, outcome-focused teams. Right? Uh, you're, don't get too preoccupied with whether or not you can build something, and try to worry about more about whether or not you actually should do that thing. Thanks so much for listening. Is there time for questions? It's so lonely up here. <laughs> do you have any questions? I mean, since I'm up here, any, any, any questions at all? Since no one's rushing to kick me off the stage either. <laughs> Here's a microphone, so... Uh, Thank you. Yep. 
Uh, you were saying about the impact of social media on young females. Do you think that uh, the young males are getting affected in the same way as well? Absolutely. I mean, there's tre tremendous, tremendous pressure, and I see it. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm biased only because I have daughters, right? I, I don't have any sons. Um, but, uh, but absolutely. I mean, there's a tremendous impact and pressure to behave a certain way, to act a certain way, to get out there um, and... Uh, uh, live up to certain expectations that they see what other people doing online and so forth. And it's it's because of this like culture, right? So so the, the motivation is to drive likes. Someone gets a lot of likes. Well, I could get a lot of likes if I do stupid stuff, right? Um, it's it's re it's really interesting uh, to see how uh, uh, how addictive it can be. And you hear, look, I hear about it. I hear about, you know, these changes that are supposed to be coming all the time, right? We're going to hide the follower counts. We're going to hide the like counts, right? To kind of see, focus more on the content. But you never see it happen, right? Because I think they know that if they start to hide that stuff, engagement starts to go down, yeah. right? So that's, that's the challenge that we find ourselves in. Thank you. I think there's a question right there. You said that... Uh we should measure both goals and values. Uh, measuring goals, as you said, uh, there are some examples of uh, measuring activity of the users. Uh, do you have some examples of measuring the values, whether users are good, tolerant, or something like that? That's a great question. I think, um, so the short answer to your question is no. Um, but, the, but the longer answer to your question is, I don't think that there's a quantify. So for example, if we're going to say, um, uh, for example, uh, I'm trying to think of a good ex of a good value. Um, right, we're we're never go we're, you know sa safety is our number one priority. Right, a value for us is is the safety of our users to make sure that that's great. Um, I suppose you could quantify that with kind of number of safety breaches of, or number of incidents, but I think ultimately there, there needs to be some kind of a, of a continuous gut check with the, organ, with, with the team that you're working on that says, does this feel like we're compromising the safety of our users, right? Is there a way, right, if we think about our values, right, um, is there a way for someone to compromise the safety of this feature to negatively impact our customers? And I think that as long as we're having those conversations and those values stay top of mind, th 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 there doesn't have to be 30 of them. Right, it could be three or four of them, right? But as long as they're top of mind, we can always have a conversation that says, like, does this thing that we're working on stand a chance of compromising safety? Does it stand a chance of compromising, um, you know, the, the ethical values that we hold as an organization? So I don't know that there's, um, I mean, you certainly can't quantify behavior, right? And quantify behavior that, that breaches some of those values. But I think you'd want to get ahead of that. Right? Like, for example, I don't want to build a, a product that, with safety as a core value in it that, that has any safety breaches. Right? Ultimately, our goal is zero, so then how do we get, how do we get ahead of, of having any at all? Uh, to me, that's the kind of conversation that becomes more interesting, but it's a fuzzier, less quantifiable conversation. I think this one over here. Thank you for your speech. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is about differentiating outputs versus outcomes. Mm. In your example, for example, yeah, uh, in the American city, <laughs> when you put a stop sign, then it is an output, but not turning left is the outcome. But is it not the correct outcome to reduce the accidents? Ultimately. So right. how to know the difference? Well, so, so those are two different outcomes, right? So if, like, ideally, so here's the thing, right? So safety of the intersection is the ultimate goal, right? And the safety of the intersection can be quantified in outcomes, right? Zero accidents, um, I don't know, zero accidents. Let's just call it that, right? So zero accidents is the goal. Um, that's an outcome, right? No one has, no one has created an accident. No one has, has gotten into a, an accident. Okay, what are, what are some leading indicators of the accidents that happen at this intersection. Well, we see that 90% of all the accidents that happen here are when people were turning left, okay? So we're hypothesizing that getting people to stop turning left will reduce accidents by 90%. It's a hypothesis. Right? Except the person, you know, in this particular case, the solution that they thought would generate that behavior was a stop sign and a no left turn sign. So the, the, the tactic 
The output was the stop sign. The goal, the, out, the, the outcome was get people to stop turning left. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is reduce accidents by 90%. So, so, so those, there's two levels of outcomes there. One is a leading indicator of the other. Well, there's a hierarchy. Absolutely, there's a hierarchy. Yeah, and, and all this stuff. Right? And it works with software as well, right? So if people log in, then they put the items in a cart, then they check out, right? Like those are all behaviors that are leading indicators of each other as well, right? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's see a hand. Thanks for the speech. And um, you shared some examples with the uh, big companies like Facebook and Volkswagen and the uh, very bad things that are be happening. And um, what do you think should happen to change there? Or are we doomed and they are, <laughs> and they are using the economical language too big to fail? To I mean, well, it's, it's, it's too big to fail, I don't believe in. Um, look, first of all, I mean, again, declare your values and stick to them. That's, that's the first thing. What are the values, what are the things that we're not willing to compromise to achieve our goals, right? Um, think about the, uh, the, the, the customer behaviors that you ultimately want to promote in the system and the things that you'd like to, to reduce in the system and design. These are private organizations, right? These aren't governments, right? So if they just, you know, for example, if, if YouTube decides tomorrow that they want to get rid of all the hate content that's on there, they can do it. They can put people on it, they can write the code, to screen for that, they can put humans against it. There are ways to do it. It's just a matter of, of declaring some kind of values that we're not willing to compromise. Right? It doesn't mean that the goals change, right? I, if, if you're YouTube, right, I totally get it that you want number of videos viewed, time on site, minutes of videos watched, shares, right? All that stuff as, as your success outcomes. That's great. But if you can declare a value that says, look, we're, we, we get to decide what's hate content, and we're going to cut all this out of here. You can also do that. It's just a matter. It's just a matter of um, of how these organizations want to uh, address their values, I guess, and and hold those values up and enforce them. I don't think it's that difficult. I think they've got the technology. I think they've got the skills, and they've got the um, the personnel to do it. They just have to choose to to do that particular work. Will they? There's no, no good sign of that happening anytime soon. Uh, I'll tell you that much. I mean, just the whole political ad thing I told you about on Facebook, where Facebook's like, look, politicians can lie, right? Let's say it, the, the, the amount of revenue that Facebook makes from political ads is inconsequential. Like in the, you know, it's, it's a drop in the bucket of Facebook money. Right? If they decided tomorrow to say, you know what? No political ads. Like, we're not going to judge true or false. No political advertising. It wouldn't move their stock price one cent. It would make no difference. They just have to choose to do it, right? And currently, I'm not seeing any indications that they're going to choose to do that. Sadly. There's one more up here in the front, and then I think we can... So this will be the last question. Okay. All right, so provided that we are living in a world that is uh, subject to a constant change, Mm -hmm. uh, do you think in 10 years you could make a lot of money on making something which is actually stable and not changing? Exam give me an example. I don't know, uh, right, like a car that has no computer at all. So you don't <laughs> wake up in the morning and uh, don't know what to expect of your own car. So. <laughs> I, look, I, I, what I'm seeing, look, what, so what I'm seeing, I, I mean, there certainly is a backlash. I think people are... People are going on, you know, digital detox retreats and things like that. I think people are, uh, you know, they're, they're, people are seeing value in, in cars that don't have computers in them because they know how to fix them. They know how to, you know. How to, so I think I think there is a bit of a backlash. I think people are looking for that. Um, I would pay attention to that market and see how it grows. Right? You can run some tests and see how it goes. There might be there might be a market for this moving in the future. Who knows? I would, Thank you. I would give it a shot. Yeah. Thank you.